Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's Garage, we're going to take an introductory look at the chips that can be made to do almost anything. The FPGAs, or Field Programmable Gate Arrays. They're logic chips that can be programmed to do almost anything that you can conceive of, and rather than having to build a physical chip or a circuit board, you simply design the circuit in software and then upload it to the FPGA. An FPGA is a bit like Lego for hardware. When you want to build a chip to do some task, you can gather up the circuitry needed and virtually assemble it like a Lego project. And rather than your design being burned into the silicon like a prom, the FPGA gets programmed to do whatever it is that you want to do, and then it can be reprogrammed any number of times. It's easy to say build or design a chip, but what does that actually mean? Well, at a high level, an FPGA is made up of a large number of configurable logic blocks, or CLBs, that can be programmed to perform various functions. Each CLB contains a number of logic gates, such as AND, OR, or NOT gates, and as well as flip-flops and other basic logic building blocks. The Lego pieces, if you will. And combining these logic gates and other building blocks in different ways allows you to create complex digital circuits. So let's spend a minute talking about those gates because that's about all you really have to understand to make sense of the rest of this. Basic logic gates are the fundamental building blocks of digital circuits. They are electronic circuits that perform a logical operation on one or more binary inputs to produce a single binary output, which can be either 1 or 0. There are several types of basic logic gates, each with its own specific logic function. Let's take a look at them. The OR gate. Imagine you have two smoke detectors and you want an alarm to sound when either one is tripped. And they should keep alarming if both are tripped, of course. In that case, you'd want an OR gate. An OR gate takes two or more signal inputs and produces an output signal if either of the input signals is high, or both. If all the inputs are low, then the output is also low. AND gate. An AND gate takes two or more signals and produces an output signal only if all the input signals are high, otherwise the output is low. NOT gate. A NOT gate, also known commonly as an inverter, has a single input and produces the opposite value at its output. That is, if the input is high, the output is low, and if the input is low, the output is high. Just the opposite. NAND gate. A NAND gate is a combination of an AND gate and a NOT gate. It produces the opposite output of an AND gate, meaning that the output is low only when the input signals are high, and it's high for any other input combination. NOR gate. A NOR gate is a combination of an OR gate and a NOT gate. It produces the opposite output of an OR gate, meaning that the output is high only when all input signals are low, and low for any other input combination. Now, in addition to the basic logic gates I mentioned earlier, there are also a couple of other types of logic gates that can perform more complex logical operations. Here's just a few quick examples. The XOR gate. An XOR gate, also known as an exclusive OR gate, takes two input signals and produces a high output if the two input signals are different. If the two inputs are the same, then the output is low. You can think of it as any one input, but not both or neither. XNOR gate. An XNOR gate, also known as an exclusive NOR gate, is a complement of an XOR gate. It produces a high output if the two input signals are the same, and a low output if the inputs are different. So if the two inputs match, the result is true. Buffer. A buffer is a logic gate that has a single input and a single output. The output of the buffer is the same as its input, with no logical operation performed. Buffers are often used to amplify or transmit signals without changing their logical state. Multiplexer. A multiplexer, or MUX for short, is a logic gate that has multiple inputs, but just a single output. It selects one of the inputs to pass through to the output based on a set of control signals. Demultiplexer. A demultiplexer, or DMUX for short, is the opposite of a multiplexer. It has a single input, but multiple outputs, and it selects one of the outputs to receive the input signal based on the set of control signals. The gates can have more than just two inputs, and they do still roughly what you'd expect. So a four-input OR gate turns on when any combination of its inputs is turned on, except for all off. And an AND gate with four inputs will only turn on when all four inputs are on. These logic gates can also be combined to create more complex logical functions. For example, the combination of an AND and a NOT gate can be used to create the NAND gate, and the combination of a NOR gate and a NOT gate can be used to create an AND gate. By combining these basic logic gates in various ways, you can create digital circuits that implement a wide range of complex functions such as arithmetic operations, memory storage, and decision making. FPGAs also typically include a number of input-output I.O. blocks that allow you to connect the FPGA to external devices such as sensors, displays, and other digital circuits. The I.O. blocks can be configured to support a variety of different interfaces such as serial, parallel, or even Ethernet.
One of the main benefits of using an FPGA is that it allows you to implement custom digital circuits that are tailored to your specific needs without the need to design and actually fabricate a custom chip. This can be useful in a variety of applications, such as prototyping new hardware designs, implementing custom digital signal processing algorithms, or building high-performance computing systems. Your alternative would be to design an entire chip in silicon, known as an ASIC, for application-specific integrated circuit. As an example, think of a chip like the video chip in a Commodore 64. You're going to produce millions of them, so in the long run, it's cheaper to produce an ASIC because while an FPGA could be programmed to do the job, at least today, they are a lot more costly. That's why you see FPGAs follow the money. If you're building just one of a comparative handful of MRI machines, for example, and you want the ability to field upgrade the logic later, then an FPGA likely makes more sense. It's the same deal with the space and defense industries. Wherever money meets the need for a quick iteration or turnaround, you're likely to find FPGAs in use. However, FPGAs can be more complex to work with than other types of programmable logic devices such as microcontrollers or digital signal processors. It's because they require specialized tools and knowledge of digital logic design to use effectively. Additionally, FPGAs are typically more expensive than other types of programmable logic devices, which makes them less accessible for hobbyists or DIY projects. So what about microcontrollers? Why would you choose an FPGA instead of a microcontroller? Well, FPGAs and microcontrollers are both types of programmable devices, but they have different strengths and weaknesses and are suited for different types of applications. Microcontrollers are typically optimized for executing a set of predefined instructions or firmware that controls the behavior of the device. They typically have a small amount of on-chip memory and peripherals, such as perhaps timers, interrupts, and communication interfaces, which makes them well-suited for a wide range of embedded systems applications, such as controlling motors, collecting sensor data, or interfacing with external devices. FPGAs, on the other hand, are designed to be highly configurable and customizable, allowing you to create custom digital circuits that are tailored to your specific needs. They're typically used in applications that require high-performance computing or digital signal processing, such as image or audio processing, cryptography, or network processing. FPGAs can also be used to implement custom hardware accelerators for specific tasks, such as crypto, machine learning, or artificial intelligence algorithms. One of the key advantages of FPGAs over microcontrollers is their flexibility. FPGAs can be reprogrammed or reconfigured multiple times, allowing you to quickly iterate and modify your digital circuit designs without having to create new physical circuits or boards. So if your satellite isn't doing what you want, you can reprogram it in place, both on the bench before and on the fly after launch. This can be a major advantage in applications where rapid prototyping or development is important. Another advantage of FPGAs is their high performance. Because FPGAs can be customized to implement specific digital circuit functionality, they can often outperform general purpose microcontrollers or DSPs for certain tasks. They are also highly parallel, which means they can perform multiple operations simultaneously, making them well suited for applications that require high speed processing of large amounts of data. Consider the case where the CPU wants to check if any of eight GPIO lines are triggered. It might have to issue a separate interrupt and I.O. instruction plus a comparison eight times to get the answer, whereas an FPGA can do it in a single clock cycle with a large OR gate. It seems that for most any task that you can express in an FPGA, it will likely be the faster solution. Overall, the choice between an FPGA and a microcontroller depends on the specific requirements of your application. If you need a general purpose device that can execute predefined instructions, a microcontroller will be the best choice. But if you need a highly configurable device that can be customized to implement specific digital circuit functionality, the FPGA is likely the better option. Now to use an FPGA, you need to program it with a configuration file that specifies the desired circuit design functionality. This configuration file is typically loaded onto the FPGA each time the device is powered on or reset. They start up blank. FPGAs have what is called a configuration memory that stores the configuration file. This memory is typically implemented using a type of non-volatile memory called flash memory. Non-volatile memory retains its contents even when powered off, making it the ideal choice for storing the FPGA configuration file. It can be self-contained within the FPGA or, more commonly, live as an external chip on the board. When the FPGA is powered on or reset, it reads the configuration file from the flash memory and uses it to configure the digital circuit functionality. And then once the FPGA is configured, it behaves as if it were just a physical digital circuit implementing the desired functionality. The role of the flash memory is critical in the FPGA configuration process. 
Without a valid configuration file in flash memory, the FPGA will not be able to operate correctly because it would remain effectively blank. Additionally, the flash memory must be fast enough to enable the FPGA to read the configuration file quickly and efficiently so it boots promptly. Because the FPGA configuration file is stored in non-volatile memory, it can be programmed or reprogrammed multiple times without the need for a physical circuit board or chip. In fact, in most designs, the FPGA is programmed from scratch using the configuration file stored in the flash memory every time the chip boots. So to completely modify the FPGA, you're really just rewriting the configuration in the flash storage and then rebooting. This allows you to quickly iterate and modify your digital circuit designs without having to create new physical circuits or boards. To program an FPGA, you typically use a hardware description language such as Verilog or VHDL to describe the desired logic functionality. Your hardware description language is then compiled into a configuration file that can be loaded onto the FPGA. Once the configuration file is loaded onto the FPGA, the device will behave as if it were an actual physical chip that you had custom designed to do whatever it is you plan to do. However, as noted, there are some challenges associated with using FPGAs. As I mentioned earlier, programming FPGAs requires specialized knowledge and tools. Additionally, FPGAs can be more power hungry than other types of programmable logic devices, which can be a concern for certain applications, particularly those powered by batteries or where heat may be a concern. So FPGAs are a powerful digital circuit design tool, especially in applications where performance and flexibility are critical. While they can be more complex and expensive to work with than other types of programmable logic devices, they offer a level of customization and performance that can be difficult to achieve with other technologies. FPGAs are used in a wide range of applications across industries, including aerospace, telecommunications, medical devices, and industrial control systems. In aerospace, FPGAs are often used for real-time data processing and control in systems such as avionics and satellite communications. In telecommunications, FPGAs are used for implementing high-speed network interfaces and digital signal processing algorithms. In medical devices, FPGAs can be used for implementing real-time monitoring and control systems. And in industrial control systems, FPGAs are used for implementing complex control algorithms and interfacing with sensors and other devices. Now, there are several types of different FPGAs available on the market, each with its own strengths and weaknesses. Some FPGAs are optimized for high performance computing tasks, while others are designed for more low power applications. Some FPGAs include specialized hardware blocks, such as digital signal processors or high speed transceivers, to enable specific functionality. In recent years, there has been a growing interest in using FPGAs for machine learning and artificial intelligence applications. Because FPGAs can be customized to implement specific algorithms, they can be used to accelerate certain types of machine learning tasks, such as neural network inference. In addition to traditional FPGA devices, there are also hybrid devices that combine FPGA functionality with other types of processing elements, such as microprocessors or graphics processing units, or GPUs. These hybrid devices offer the flexibility of FPGAs along with the performance of other processing elements, making them well suited for a range of high performance computing applications. One of the main trends in the FPGA industry is the move towards cloud-based FPGA development and deployment. This allows designers to work with their FPGAs on a virtual basis without needing to purchase or manage physical devices. Cloud-based FPGA services can also provide access to specialized hardware and software tools that may not be available to designers working with the traditional FPGA devices. Another trend in the FPGA industry is the development of open source FPGA tools and platforms. These initiatives aim to make FPGA technology more accessible to a wider range of designers and developers by providing free open source tools for FPGA development and deployment. Now, as with any technology, there are also potential drawbacks to using FPGAs. In addition to the complexity and the cost associated with programming FPGAs, there may be concerns around security and reliability. Because FPGAs can be reprogrammed, there is always a risk of malicious actors using them to perform unauthorized operations or accessing sensitive data. Additionally, because FPGAs are highly configurable, there is a risk of unintentional errors or bugs creeping into the design that could lead to system failures or other issues. Despite these challenges, FPGAs remain an important tool for digital circuit design and are likely to continue to play a key role in circuit design for a long time to come. If you're interested in tinkering with an FPGA to learn more about it, there are several starter kits that resemble an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. They come with all of the support logic, flash RAM, and communications built in so that you can start learning and building immediately. I'll put a link to a few examples in the video description. 
Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. Now remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so if you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. And if you or someone you know may be on the autism spectrum, check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. Check the link in the video description. In the meantime and in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.